three, two, one, boom. Conversations with interesting people. Carol Throckmorton, it is excellent to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So I met you a couple of years ago for the first time, but for people that are not familiar with you or to remind people that it's been a while, tell us a little bit about you, your training, your background, hit us. Well, I, as you can imagine, there's a long story that goes with this. So I'm gonna to try to do the short version. You have plenty of time. Version. So I, w I went to college. I decided when I was 34 and the mother of a five and seven year old that I wanted to go to college. Great. So that meant uh, leaving my home environment in Northwest Iowa, moving to Ames. And uh, within the first three weeks I had enrolled my children in school, I had found a, found a place to live and found a job at the university. And I had a whole new life within three weeks. So I, I worked part-time. I found out kind of serendipitously that if you work at the university and you have an agreeable uh, supervisor that you can take classes uh, while, you're, while you're working. Okay. So I was working full-time and I started to, the whole goal of course is to get a college degree because I had a business degree before. Uh, and so I worked uh, in a program in the Department of Education and my, it, and my supervisor, since we were in education, was very happy to accommodate my desire to take classes. So <clears throat> I wanted a degree. I did not know what I wanted to do. It was like, okay, I was stayed here. I am. What, what's going to happen next? So uh, the very first class I took was a career development class. And so the testing and the career development class indicated uh, the field of dietetics and nutrition. So I said, okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as I could, still working full time, I started working in for my core classes, and me and me and my children, my children and I, went to Iowa State together, essentially. So um, I did that for about three years, part time work, or yeah, part time work, part time student, and then the last two years I was full time student. Great. So, at, in 1986, I. I graduated with a degree in nutrition, food nutrition dietetics program. So that was my launch into a whole new career. I, I was 39 when I graduated, so. Yeah, and, and Iowa State, for anybody listening who's not from around here, uh, has a, a fairly renowned uh, dietetics program. Yes. So you were, you were well-trained, I guess it would probably be fair to say. I would say that that's, that's true too. I think, oh, and you retired not long ago, yes? Yes, I had a 30-year career. Uh, which took me in a number of directions, and the, the, the direction that I feel most proud about is that I uh, chose a, the field of cardiology as a specialty. So the way this goes is that students graduate from uh, their university program, and then they, they are a generalist for a few years, typically. And then they make a decision, it's like, okay, I want to specialize in diabetes or uh, neuro or gastrointestinal disorders or whatever. For me, it was cardiology, it was very clear. That's, that's my place. So my whole goal, my whole, uh, my, my North Star in this whole thing was to help people to learn how to be healthy so that they could live long and healthy lives because I saw too many situations where people were taken down by diseases. Either, mm. either they were disabled or it was a real impediment in their life because of the disease that they were dealing with. <clears throat> so I wanted to be a, a person who could help people to learn what they needed to know so that they could live long and healthy lives and fulfill their goal and their mission in their own personal lives. So that was really my North Star when I started this whole thing. So um, I was at, uh, I, my first job was in East Tennessee uh, so I worked in the hospital as a generalist there for uh, four years, and I was the only dietitian on staff. So I did both administrative, the, the food service part, as well as clinical with patients. I had, some many, I had many, many interesting experiences there. One that stands out is the day that I was doing a diet instruction with a woman who uh, was uh, spitting tobacco into a styrofoam cup <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> the entire time that we were talking. That was a little irregular. That's not something you can find in Iowa. Sorry, a little edit. Yeah, no, it's okay. Little, uh, little, little bit of a mic snafu. It happens all the time. Uh, so, so you were in Tennessee, and so what? Uh, keep telling the story. What eventually brought you back to Iowa? And well, a couple of major things. Um, I, I, I left Iowa to go to East Tennessee because of the weather. The last winter that I was at Iowa State, there was there was like three feet of snow on on the ground the entire winter. 
uh, and I said, I, I'm tired of Iowa winners. I have got to get out of here. <laughs> so I, I didn't even look for a job in Iowa. I said, I'm going to East Tennessee. Uh, there was a book that was popular at the time that was called Places Rated Almanac hmm. that rated 265 places around the United States based on 10 criteria. One is healthcare and um, cultural, uh, cultural opportunities and safety and all those kinds of things. So I targeted East Tennessee. That's, that's how I ended up in East, in East Tennessee. Okay. Uh, and it was a, I'm an adventurous sort of person. And it's like, well, I've never really been to Tennessee. I've never lived in the South, so let's give it a try. So, so we did that. But living in the South is a different experience. <laughs> if you're a Northerner, you're always a Northerner in the South. So the... There were two things that really made me come back. One was uh, uh, some uh, white supremacist activity in the area wow. where I lived that was pretty scary. Uh, when you go to a neighboring town, you see in the storefront a, a picture of Adolf Hitler, full-size storefront. Wow. Um, that's pretty scary. Uh, and there were some other things that were, that, and it, was, it made me fearful for my children. I didn't want my mm. children to grow up with that kind of an influence. So at about the same time, my mother was having some significant health problems, <clears throat> and she lived in um, the Quad City area. So uh, I did not, I, I could see the writing on the wall. She was 81 at the time, hmm. and I needed to be back here to help her through her last years. So that was my catalyst for returning. But I have to say, <clears throat> as I drove back to Iowa from Tennessee for the last the last time as I moved from Tennessee to Iowa, it's like, I'm going home. So I was, I was back home. I was yeah. going back home. Yeah. And I've, I've not regretted that at all. So learned, learned a few things. So I went to medical school in the South and certainly uh, outside of the university setting, there were a lot of Confederate flags. Uh, I never saw, I guess, quite to that level. Um, it, it's kind of interesting, I guess, in a way, because it, it feels like in the news, in the last few years, like the stuff in Charlottesville and so forth, mm -hmm. is that is that triggering for you at all, given what you saw in oh, Tennessee? Yeah, yeah. Th those kinds of things don't surprise me at all. You know, and uh, certainly Virginia is considered South, and it was in it's interesting your experience because uh, the military had me in Alabama, which was deep South, mm -hmm. and I want to say for the <clears throat> record uh, that I never. Uh, experienced any sort of uh, issues in the South. Everybody was always very, very nice to me. Uh, clearly, I was called Yankee, and uh, it was clear that I was from the North, but nobody was ever rude to me. Alabama was a completely different beast from North Carolina. And what I always said was, I loved North Carolina. I loved going to medical school in North Carolina. Had every intention of staying in North Carolina, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm an Iowan, and I guess fate, or whatever you want to call it, brought me back here, and now I'm married and have a kid, and just like generations of woods is before me. I'm probably going to die here. But uh, what I always said about North Carolina was it was far enough north that I felt like I got uh, some of the northern, uh, I don't know, different kind of politeness, but, uh, but it, the, sort of the, some of the, the northern charm and the southern charm were, were blended well, whereas Alabama was south-south. It was mm -hmm. deep south, and there was a lot of Civil War talk and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sounds like you almost got more of that stereotypical deep mm -hmm. south in Tennessee, mm -hmm. where you were at least. Is that, is that right? It was, a, it was a fairly rural era, area, uh, area. It was north of uh, Knoxville and south of the uh, Tri-City area. Uh, my experience was that people were very friendly, you know, the, my coworkers and so forth were very friendly, but they did not invite you into their social circles. Hmm. So the northerners who worked in the hospital setting where I was were friends. And the other, the other, the southerners were, were nice to us, but they really didn't interact. Oh, okay. Much. So that okay. was a, I didn't expect that. I was you, surprised. You were, you were older than I was and you had a family uh, as a young man uh, in the military, whenever I would go to church or I would be out and about, I would seem to find these grandmother age women that were trying to set me up with their granddaughters. Oh. <laughs> and so uh, I very much felt invited in, but different uh, age, different place mm -hmm. in our lives. Mm -hmm. I clearly was military. I was had a short haircut and I was uh, a lot skinnier and uh, younger. And so what I remember so much from Alabama, again, everybody was so nice, was that I did have a girlfriend at the time and she was from the Chicagoland area. And I would often get asked uh, if I either were married or had a girlfriend, I would say yes. And the first question was, is she a Northern girl? 
Uh-huh. And uh, and I would I would say no. She was from the Chicago land area, and I still remember one woman in church, she, who was fully dressed. I was dressed like I am dressed today, which is how you dress in for Presbyterian church when you're from the north in the summer. Mm-hmm. They all the men had coats and ties on, which I was not ready for, and she was dressed in a big in a dress with a hat. And I mean, I felt like I was in a movie. Really, mm-hmm. people think I'm exaggerating. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. but you live in the south. You know what I'm talking about. I thought I was in a movie. Anyway. She said to me, she literally said this phrase, which is why I remember it. You should really be with a Southern girl. Southern women know how to treat our men folk. And she actually used the word men folk. And I remember thinking to myself, mm-hmm. I already feel like I'm in a movie. And now this, mm-hmm. this woman with this gorgeous sort of old Southern accent mm-hmm. uh, just told me that I needed a Southern girl because they know how to treat their men folks. So yeah. uh, definitely different, those of us that yes. grew up in Iowa yes. and, and so forth. And so um, did you grow up in the Quad City area then? No, I grew up near Des Moines, actually, a town called Monroe, southeast of Des Moines. And so I heard you say <clears throat> Northwest Iowa. Mm-hmm. And so you've lived all over the state. I, yeah, I've lived uh, in basically uh, the Des Moines area, well, and Ames, which is central Iowa, of course, right. too. And then uh, Lorenz, which is in northwest Iowa. Right. And then now Iowa City, Coralville area. And my mother lived in Davenport, so I'm pretty familiar with the, Daven- the Quad City area as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. So back to your profession. <clears throat> I think your profession has some of the same problems that mine does with definition in that... Uh, you say dietitian. There's the registered dietitian. I don't know if there's anything like a not registered dietitian. There are many people that call themselves nutritionists. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you listen to shows like this, you'll find people that uh, and call themselves doctor, and they are doctors, but often not physicians. There is a woman that uh, is on Joe Rogan's program, often named Rhonda Patrick who is a PhD researcher of some kind. So mm-hmm. help us navigate this a little bit. What is, an, what is a, a registered dietitian? What does that mean versus all the other kind of people that sort of insert themselves into the mm-hmm. nutritional dialogue that's happening nationwide? To be a registered dietitian, you have to pass an exam, which is about four hours. This is a post uh, your graduate, you know, after you've graduated from your um, undergraduate program, you have to take an exam, and that uh, that qualifies you as a registered dietitian. Registered dietitians can op- can function in hospital type setting. They can do therapeutic diets and so forth. Things where uh, the the health and well being of a, of a person is really at high risk. So they're more uh, able to do the therapeutic types of diets. Um, and then you have to be licensed too. So licensure came in in about 1986, I believe it was, in various states. Um, so that uh, meant that you, uh, if you were, if you called yourself a nutritionist, now, when, when I graduated from Iowa State, I was a nutritionist, and and all dietitians are nutritionists, but not all people who call themselves nutritionists are or dietitians. Dietitian. So that's okay. the distinction between the two. And it used to be that people could just take an online course or decide that they knew a lot about nutrition and could call themselves nutritionists. Well, you can't do that anymore. So. So if, if somebody were looking to get help um, for uh, their nutritional needs and so forth, uh, much like, and I'll, I'll put this on myself so you don't wind up being the heavy if you say something like I'm going to say, when somebody, anybody can call themselves a therapist. Mm-hmm. In my business, that happens a lot. A counselor, at least. Um, there are many people who have a two-year degree uh, that maybe took a counseling course or they're uh, in a religious affiliation of some kind that call themselves counselor. I tell my patients that, in my opinion, although they can be good people, well-intentioned, who certainly can visit with you, that mm-hmm. I prefer somebody uh, to send my patients somebody with a license. Right. So uh, usually that means they have a master's degree, in, in counseling of some kind, uh, a PhD, an MSW. So I would personally recommend anybody listening or anybody mm-hmm. that I see in my office who, who wants therapy to mm-hmm. see a licensed person. So mm-hmm. let's say that I'm yeah, any variety of people, an overweight person that wants help, uh, somebody with a chronic disease that needs help, a sports person looking to maximize their uh, performance and so forth, and mm-hmm. I decide I want to see somebody in the nutrition field. Mm-hmm. You are a 30-some year experienced dietitian. Who do you think that person should go and see? Well, the, traditionally, and physicians will refer to a registered licensed dietitian for a therapeutic diet. Say it's a, a person who is newly diagnosed with diabetes or if they have a gastrointestinal disorder or whatever. Um, what's, what is lacking is that 
as you know, this is what we have is a disease care system. It is not a health care system. So what we what we end up with is you know traditional dietetic practice, and it's uh, it's not a whole food plant based diet. In fact, it's uh, it's pretty shocking to know that dietitians get extremely minimal amounts of education in a whole food plant based diet. It's a very traditional uh, meat based diet, meats meat inclusive diet, and they're not really uh, educated and knowledgeable in uh, a plant based type plant type plant-based type of diet. Can you edit that out? <laughs> You're doing so, great. Keep going. <laughs> so there's a there's a there's a, a, a problem in that that there's not enough of a movement toward what we know is true as far as plant-based diet is concerned, a whole food plant-based diet and the benefits. I went to a conference recently and heard uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell uh, talk about uh, nutrient, and he's of course a very well-known figure, uh, wrote the, Ch the China study, did the China study research and so forth, very knowledgeable, very highly respected in this field. Mm -hmm. He said uh, a, a whole food plant-based diet can prevent and reverse disease. So what does that say about a meat-based diet? Do meat-based diets cause disease? Well, that's an interesting thing because nobody talks about that. So if a whole food plant-based diet can, re can re prevent and reverse diseases, hmm, let's think about this traditional diet that includes meat and dairy and eggs and if that's promoting disease problem disease uh, uh, issues for people so you were you were doing my job so well for me because because uh, I was I was sort of going more broadly and I was going to sort of <clears throat> move move into the more specific things mm -hmm. so I know about you uh, but not everybody might that your focus your sort of general take mm -hmm. on nutrition and uh, and performance and long life and you know sort of vibrancy is sort of in this whole food plant-based genre but there's so much of a conversation going on I, there's so much confusion which is why I sort of began with the credentialing and kind of because mm -hmm. anybody can call themselves uh, like you said a nutritionist uh, what I think is interesting and uh, I can say with 100% uh, a surety in my life is that people go to their doctor and expect that we the physician and I try to use that term because a PhD is definitely a doctor, right? But a physician, they expect that we have some kind of knowledge about mm. nutrition and we need more people like you, definitely, because in my, so I went to a top five medical school, which I don't say to brag, uh, it just, I went, I was a, in a highly uh, academic medical center that's well respected. We got one, in four years, mm -hmm. one optional lunch class that was run by an RD, mm -hmm. and about half the class didn't go. I then went to four years of residency mm -hmm. at the University of Iowa in psychiatry. Zero times was mm -hmm. diet mentioned beyond uh, if people aren't eating well, that might speak to their depression level mm -hmm. or something like that. So let's get some definitions going because you just outed yourself as a, as a plant-based person, which, which again, I knew, but, uh, and not the reason I had you on specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to say again for the record before all the haters and trolls come on and tell me that I'm trying to be specific to uh, whole food plant-based people, I would welcome a conversation with somebody as qualified as Carol who thinks about uh, animal products and uh, different diets. I would welcome that conversation. But let's get some definitions going because I think there can be some confusion. So let's have you define what's the difference between a vegetarian diet, mm -hmm. a vegan <clears throat> diet, and a whole food plant-based diet. Okay, so a vegetarian diet uh, does not include animal flesh. So people who are observing a, a vegetarian type diet will eat all kinds of plants, but they will also likely include uh, dairy products, uh, eggs, one or the other, or both. Uh, they don't have an issue as far as using honey and that type of thing. So they, uh, they, they kind of draw the line on the animal flesh part. You know, they'll, they'll, they won't eat the animal flesh, but they'll eat the, bi the byproducts of that particular animal species. So a vegan is a, a person who observes a 100% plant, a plant-based diet. So there's, there's no eggs, there's no dairy, there's no animal flesh. And, and most do not use honey because it's a, it comes from bees and they are against uh, exploitation of animals. And, and insects would be in that category as well. Um, so a, a, a person who's, who is vegan 
observes a, a plant-based diet, but not necessarily whole food. So whole food really means that most of the foods that you eat are in their original form. It looks like something that grew from the earth. And so when I worked with patients a lot of the time, and they were asking me these questions, I, I, I would say, eat food that looked like it was once attached to the earth. Okay, so that would be a whole foods. So that doesn't mean that you can't use recipes and you know all kinds of ways to impart flavor into food like herbs and spices and those mm -hmm. types of things. Those are plant-based too. Yeah. Uh, but you can observe a vegan diet and not have a healthy vegan diet because you know if you're using lots of high, highly processed foods. What we're really trying to get people away from doing is these highly processed foods and the supermarkets are loaded with them. So the farmers markets are a good place for plant to get good healthy fresh plants. Uh, supermarkets you can you know, sometimes we don't know where the plants are coming from, right. so, you, but you have options there. But most of the time, you know, you want to you want to look for things that are in their whole original form. And you're, like I say, you're going to cook them, you're going to change them, you're going to modify them for the taste and texture that you like. And people say, well, that's pretty limiting if you take meat out of the diet. You know, what do you? Well, there's nothing interesting left. Well, that's one of the first things that I found when I switched to a vegan diet was that it was like a whole new world of cooking opened up. So you, uh, if you're used to putting a pork chop on your plate with mashed potatoes and corn, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what you're used to and that's uh, what you'll gravitate toward too. If you take the pork chop off the plate, it's like, oh, I've got to come up with something else. And so that's where you have to get kind of creative and say, okay, I've got some other options. And my goodness, the, there's a plethora of cookbooks. New vegan cookbooks are coming out all the time, whether it's whole food, plant-based or vegan. Uh, you know, but you can, you can veganize pretty much any recipe any favorite traditional recipe just by substitutions. Um, uh, so it's, it is not difficult. People think that it's a whole different category of food and that's really not true. Most of the foods that people eat, if, if they're eating a relatively healthy diet, even if, it's, if it does include meat, which I would say is not healthy, but if they're eating plants at all, those are vegan foods. It's not like there's a, a, a plant-based diet and then the standard American diet because mm -hmm. most of the things people eat are going to be in the plant category to start right. with. So right. it's just finding something else to take, you know, you, you can substitute plant milks for the dairy products and my goodness there's wonderful new uh, non-dairy cheese. That's been the, the, the kicker for a lot of people. It's like, ah, oh, I can't give up my cheese, mm -hmm. but now there's some cheeses that really taste like, uh, they're plant-based cheeses that taste like real cheese. Uh, and you don't need eggs. Uh, <laughs> there's a new product now that's called Just Eggs. I don't know if you've ever, if you've had an opportunity have, to see that. I have. So I made an omelet the other day that was uh, restaurant quality, and a, a, a good restaurant quality omelet. So you can you can do that too. So the the the, the market is is responding to the demand for these kinds of foods, and so there's just new things coming out all the time. Yeah, so so many uh, so many avenues to go down. We'll have to have you back because our our two hours or so is, is going to go by so quickly. There's so much I want to talk to you about, uh, and where I'm going to go uh, from here is is just on what you said, which is, is I want to get back to the whole food, plant based versus veganism, which I think veganism has a PR problem. Uh, I think the term vegan has become a little bit like Amway. Whereas it, it sort of it, it turns people's uh, mm -hmm. turns people's minds like oh my god oh my mm -hmm. god vegans they're gonna roll their eyes and oh mm -hmm. it's just you know these these obnoxious people that are sort of mm -hmm. doing all this stuff but because because you're the dietitian like we definitely could get to the ethical piece of it I'm gonna try to have my uh, my friend the vegan YouTuber Mike the vegan on at some point who is definitely involved in the health piece but he's more involved with that but anyway. Recently, just recently in the news, right? So the 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 the, the Whopper now they have the Impossible Burger mm -hmm. version. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there was the thing about K, the KFC chicken sandwich that was the you know the the, the plant based chicken sandwich. <clears throat> What's your take <clears throat> on, like you said, this this more more and more it's being popularized in the culture. Mm -hmm. Celebrities are coming out. Uh, the movie The Game Changers will be out soon. Mm -hmm. But specifically, I guess. I'm veering off. Based on the food side, what do you think about the fast food entry uh, of some of these products go? So if a person likes to hang out at fast food restaurants and they like the Whoppers and the Big Macs and that type of thing, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction for them to use uh, these other burgers. You know, they're going to do fast food. This is the best of what's out there. But having said that, 20 grams of saturated fat 
mostly from coconut oil, is not a healthy oil. So those are not necessarily, well, they are not healthy burgers to have. So it's a, but if, it, if it's going to cause people to not eat foods like beef and pork and so forth, and fried chicken, who knows what that actually is inside that fried coating. <laughs> you know, if, this, if it gets them to eat something else that's plant-based, that's a step in the right direction. And some people will not go any further than that. You know, they're fast foodies, they always have been, and they, mm -hmm. they have no desire to change. So it is helpful for them to at least use those uh, substitute, substitute types of products. And hopefully that will inspire them <laughs> to move on to uh, include some healthier types of foods in their diet. And hopefully there, there are more health-promoting types of foods coming in the fast food industry too. Right, and, and so if you, know, uh, if you are sort of on the, the plant-based kick, you know, I, I see a lot of haters online about uh, somewhere in the Scandinavian countries, McDonald's has, McDonald's has the McVegan burger, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Impossible Burger. Have you had an Impossible Burger? I, I, ha <laughs> I have. And I've, I've also had the Beyond Meat. Uh, I had Beyond Meats like six months ago. And so I cooked it up and I could, I could, har I could hardly eat it because it was like my brain was saying, my, my left brain was saying, this is not meat. My, left, my, left, yeah. my, my right brain was saying, this smells like meat, it looks like meat, it looks like something I haven't eaten for 25 years. And I was like, ugh. But I, I felt like I had a, an obligation to at least try it. Right. And it, it does taste like what I remember. Mm -hmm. um, my, my mother used to call it hamburger steak years ago. So you, you've been plant-based for how many years? Uh, well, I'll, I would say I've, I've, been ve I've, been, I've been vegetarian for 25 years. Of that period of time, I've probably been strictly vegan for about the last 10. Okay. Uh, um, can I venture into the Ornish program information? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, there, are, there are no <laughs> limits to this conversation, Carol. Okay. Okay. I'm enjoying myself. Uh, we, we have tons of time. Talk okay. about whatever you want. Okay, so the reason that my path toward this actually came back to when I was a cardiac dietitian at Mercy Medical Center in Des Moines and I was frustrated because I was teaching the American Heart Association to my cardiac patients, cardiac patients who had had either bypass surgery or stents or transplants. Was you that know. DASH diet back then? Or? Yeah, that was actually before DASH. It was before yeah, DASH, okay. Yeah. So it was American Heart Association diet. So my patients would, would come back and they would have more procedures and they would say, you know, I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm following the American Heart Association diet, but I still have these problems. So in my mind, I'm saying, you know, there's got to be a better way. This is not working. So the Heart Association diet is not working <laughs> for heart patients. So I... Uh, Swing and a mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just, I had this occasion one time to be walking through one of the bookstores in Des Moines. And I looked down and I saw this book that said, The Dr. Dean Ornish Program for Reversing Heart Disease. And so being a cardiac dietitian, I mean, I stopped in my tracks. It's like... Reversing heart disease, you can't do that. Right. Nobody, nobody has said that you can, has, has determined that you can reverse heart disease. There was no conversation about reversing mm -hmm. heart disease. So I snagged up the book, took it home and read it. And, and after I read it, I said, this is what we need to be doing about heart disease. So it was um, all lifestyle modification. It was a, a near vegan diet. It was called a vegetarian low fat diet. But the reason I say it was near vegan is that they, the patients who were in this program, it was a five year research program. Well. I'm kind of getting my ahead of myself here, but um, <clears throat> so it was a it was based on a vegetarian low fat diet. But they could have the patients who were in doing this could have only one serving of non fat dairy per day. That's to keep the cholesterol low, and they could have egg whites that have zero cholesterol. That's so that's why it's near vegan and mm -hmm. it was extremely low fat. So the the low fat diet, um, stress management, group support, social support because they were making such a significant change, and uh, ed and exercise. Those are the four pillars of the Ornish program. So shortly after I read that book, within like two months, I found out that the hospital where I was working in Des Moines was going to be a research site for the Dean Ornish program. And I thought, oh, that's cool. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. I, I thought, how, how could this be that I could be so, it, I, it could be such a fortuitous situation that I could actually uh, at least be uh, peripherally involved in, in a research project that was going to demonstrate or was potentially going to demonstrate reversal of heart disease. So I immediately called the director of the, of the program and she said, well, we already have two dietitians on staff, uh, so we don't really need anybody right now. So, but in my mind, I said, they are going to need another dietitian. So <laughs> that was in October of 1993. 
on January 1st of 1994, I went on the, di the Ornish program because I thought in my mind, if I'm going to teach this diet, I need to live it. So that was, that was my date. That was you know, January 1st, 1994 was the day that I started this. So um, <coughs> I, I stayed in touch with the director of the program and so forth. Five months later, I was on staff. I was a nutrition educator, and I was teaching the low fat, the, the um, uh, vegetarian low fat diet to the cardiac patients who were in the cohorts that were in the research project. Mm -hmm. And I did that for the remaining four and a half years of the of the oh, project. Wow. So that changed my life uh, and my direction, my career direction. And I I always say that was the pinnacle of my career. His research still stands, and there have been other physicians who have shown that through lifestyle change you can reverse. Uh, type 2 diabetes, for an example. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Ornish, by the way, went on to show that you can reverse uh, prostate cancer. You can stop the progression of uh, prostate cancer through a plant-based diet. And that was, his research was a vegan, low-fat diet. Did you ever get to meet Dr. Ornish? Oh, sure. He, Dr. Ornish came to Des Moines. Uh, we were uh, one of his, I think we were one of his favorite uh, sites, so he would come and uh, we would chat with him at our staff meetings and so forth. And, and I remember uh, the second cohort, uh, we were sitting around the table, the staff was sitting around the table, and there were like 32 people in that cohort, which was large. And I, I just, I can still see Dr. Ornish at the end of this conference with the staff. He said, isn't it fun changing people's lives this mm. way? And it really was. I've seen interviews with him, and he, he seems very genuine. Yes. And uh, so you're the first person I've, uh, I've met who's actually met him. And I, I'm laughing to myself because I asked if you'd met him, and you, 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 it was like I'd asked you if you'd ever, I don't know, met the postman. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> um, this guy that I've seen. I, the, I was struck by Dr. Esselstyn's work when I first started looking into it because as a physician, I was told the same thing that you mentioned, which is there's no way we might be able to halt heart disease, but probably not. But if we use the right drugs, mm -hmm. I definitely never heard there was a way to reverse it. Definitely not heard a way to reverse diabetes. Once you have it, you have it. And then how are we going to manage it? Um, so I don't pontificate too much. I'm 100% I'm, I'm confident you're familiar with this work. It, tell people about Dr. Esselstyn's work as you understand it, because that was the one. I know, I know you know the picture mm -hmm. I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, and when we, when we record this, we'll try to get Cooper to throw in a picture here. Tell us a little bit about that. As well, Dr. Esselstyn is affiliated with the Cleveland Clinic, and he actually replicated, after Dr. Ornish's research, he went on to do the program too. He, his diet, though, was, was very strictly a vegan-type diet, whole foods plant, whole food plant-based diet. So he went on to show that, that you can reverse heart disease and uh, has many, many patients that he's worked with. Um, I'm not exactly sure how the, the other components play in as far as the exercise and the social support and stress management with his program. I think his was primarily diet with probably at least an exercise component. And he has that wonderful picture of that, uh, that descending coronary artery mm -hmm. of his friend that mm -hmm. you see being blocked up and then however long later and you can just mm -hmm. see how uh, how it's no longer no longer blocked up mm -hmm. but I, I, I think that this is all very interesting uh, it certainly when I first started looking into it really blew my mind because there's so much that wasn't taught but uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to play devil's advocate because there's once again there's so much noise and it seems mm -hmm. like there are so many people that don't want that don't want the research to be correct and mm -hmm. they make all kinds of claims of I don't know if it's bias or just uh, it, it's it, it's it's they're they're attributing it to the whole food plant-based diet when it's not so I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a minute and we're gonna talk about a couple of things and some of the other popular diets the mm -hmm. first thing I want to say before I forget and I go into some of these things because uh, there's some hater listening who's still listening because he I'm gonna say maybe he or she because he is just seething about the fact that you said it's got to look like it comes from the ground. What about tofu? Tofu does not look like it comes from the ground. There's no tofu plant. I promise you there's at least one person out there. So I wanted to say that earlier, but I didn't want to stop okay. you. So what do you think about <clears throat> tofu? Is tofu part of a whole food plant-based diet? It actually is. So uh, as I said, you can take whole foods and cook them. Well, uh, tofu comes from soybeans. Uh, we have this wonderful place in the Iowa City area that's called Old Capital Food Company, and you can go over there, you can make an appointment, and you can see them make tofu. Tofu is soybeans that have been boiled, 
uh, the, the fibrous part has been removed because it's a little less digestible and they add a coagulant which is calcium gluconate or calcium, uh, some type of calcium. That's all, that, that's all it is. It's soybeans and water uh, and the coagulant. So the, if you boil up the soybeans, and you can do this in your own kitchen, you can make your own soy milk if you want to. If you really want to make tofu in your kitchen, you can do that too. That is about as least processed as you can possibly get for, for this type of a product. Shout out to Old Capital Tofu Company. Uh, would love to have any of those guys on the program. I will say that, that I'm a meat guy that loves uh, that sort of hearty texture, that mm -hmm. chewy, so forth. Uh, I've had lots of kinds of tofu. They are not sponsoring this program, although I'd, I would be open to that. Again, Old Capital <laughs> Tofu guys. Their tofu that is called the firmest, they, uh, if you look uh, in the grocery store, and it's for the longest time, they only sold to restaurants, and now you can get it in the grocery store. But it's like firm, firmer, firmest. Uh, the texture of that firmest, I've never had anything that comes close to that in terms of like its, its overall quality of that. But So you know I'm going to have to ask about protein. Anybody who hints that they might be thinking about being vegetarian and definitely vegan, they're going to get the protein question. Uh, I saw a meme in the last year that just cracked me up that uh, it was like it had different conversations and one was like, man, I had a hard week at work. I'm totally going to go out and get wasted this weekend. And the person responding was like, yeah, man, you do that. You totally earned it. And one was like, man, like I'm going to hook up with this hot chick I met at the bar. And it was like, yeah, man, you totally do that. And the third one was like, I'm going to be vegetarian. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so bad for your health. What about your protein? What about your whatever? Like, I thought that was funny. So, yeah. you know, uh, I'm not even gonna, gonna lead you into this because I wouldn't even know where to start. Tell us about protein and how, how big of a role does it even play? Uh, certainly there's people that argue about that. Mm -hmm. And then what about protein on a vegetarian mm -hmm. or vegan diet? Well, the first thing I wanna say is that people think that they're, pro they're, they're likely to be protein deficient on a plant-based diet because the meat industry has been promoting their products. Remember the, all of the promotions about the beef industry and so forth? Uh, what was that one that was so popular? Where's the beef? Where's, Where's the, the beef? beef? That, was, so, that was Wendy's, right? Yeah, 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 that was many years ago. So uh, the livestock industry, uh, the pork industry, and probably the, well, the eggs and the dairy industry, they want you to think you're protein deficient. So that you'll buy, their, they'll, you'll keep buying their products. The truth of the matter is that you can get adequate protein on a hundred percent whole food, plant-based diet because there's protein in everything. Protein is not just found in meat and milk and eggs and so forth. Everything you eat has protein in it. So plants are a very good source, uh, and actually they're a better source um, than the uh, uh, animal products. So if, why is that? Why are they a better source? Uh, they have the non-heme iron, which is less promoting of heart disease than the heme iron that's found in animal products. That's one of the things, one of the reasons. Uh, so, and there's all, the other thing that's, uh, that people are confused about is that they think that there's, there's a lack of amino acids in certain foods and you have to you know, balance your diet so that you get the right con combination. People will say the plant protein is incomplete, yeah. go. But, but you're eating a variety of foods and so what's incomplete in one is complete in another. So you eat those kinds of foods together. They don't have to be eaten at the same time. You have those foods in your diet and you're gonna get adequate amino, amino acids. Your body knows what to do with the, the amino acids when they're coming in. So you eat protein uh, from plant sources, it goes to the liver eventually through the digestive process and your liver says, okay, well, I can make, I've got enough inventory here, I can make the proteins that I need for various purposes. The other thing is that I, 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 I just, I want people to understand that the research shows, and this is, this is valid research of large populations, that shows that people who eat a plant-based diet live an average of eight years longer than people who eat meat. So what does that say? Does that say that vegetarian diets are deficient in any way? No, <laughs> they actually promote health to the point where they, uh, people can live longer. And they live longer because they don't get heart disease, they don't get cancer, and uh, many of the other myriad, well, type two diabetes is a classic example too. So you can live longer, you can live more healthfully, uh, enjoy your life, your family, you know, your hobbies, you know, if you like to travel and so forth, you get another eight years to do all that kind of thing and you live healthfully. What if you want to be an athlete or what if you're pregnant? I mean, is it, you know, do we need to worry about protein or different nutrients if we're in one of those kind of states? 
uh, not very much more. Actually, uh, again, people think that they need to have huge amounts of, of uh, protein and they really don't. So the average female needs to have about 45 to 55 grams of protein per day. A man is about 55 to 60, somewhere in that range. Maybe another 10 grams per day for, for a woman who's pregnant. Uh, but again, the body knows what to do with these amino acids and the protein sources. Even people who are weight trainers don't need to have a large amount of additional protein. And the, and the people who are taking in large amounts of protein, people who are on a carnivore diet, <laughs> they're actually uh, creating problems for themselves in a form of kidney stones, for an example, mm -hmm. osteoporosis uh, down the road because the, the protein, the acidity of the protein, the animal protein can leach uh, uh, calcium from the bones. Yeah. So, so no concerns about protein. Uh, yeah, on if, a, if a person's eating a whole food plant-based diet. Okay. And they're getting adequate calories to support their weight. So when I first was exploring this uh, in my own life, my mother, who is very well-meaning, uh, said, well, I just don't understand why you wouldn't want to consume milk. Uh, it seems like that's a very natural food. Uh, humans have been consuming it for a long mm -hmm. time. What do you say about dairy? Well, cow's milk is for baby cows. It's not for humans. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we know that uh, populations around the world, we see the, the people who drink the most dairy products are the ones that have the worst osteoporosis. So people are drinking milk thinking that the calcium is building strong bones, and that's absolutely not true. So you do not need to have the calcium, and there, there are other factors that come into play too. Right, and, and that's something that I think blows a lot of people's mind because we grew up with advertising slogans mm -hmm. like milk does a body good mm -hmm. and milk for strong bones. I mean, everybody knows that, but based on what you just said, that's, that's not it's correct. It's absolutely not true. And it should not be consumed. Like I said, milk, we, we shouldn't be drinking milk of a different species, okay? So human milk is for humans. And we know that's an important thing for babies to have um, their mother's milk as they're in their, uh, in their, their uh, infant and uh, early toddler years. Uh, but once they're weaned, you know, they, don't, they absolutely do not need to have milk in the diets, but certainly not cow's milk. You mentioned T. Colin Campbell earlier, and mm -hmm. I took his E. Cornell class mm -hmm. on plant-based nutrition as my last set of uh, CMEs, continuing mm -hmm. medical education credits. I think it was, it was Dr. Campbell that I first heard say this, that if you look at the protein content of human milk, mm -hmm. it's uh, certainly not high protein by any, any stretch of the imagination, uh, that it sort of falls into this, everyone knows him for the China study, but the, the book he wrote that I like the best is called Whole, W-H-O-L-E, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and he, he talks about the sort of the protein ratios, and he points out that the most natural food for humans that are baby humans, human milk, has uh, this sort of uh, much lower protein ratio. Is, is that right? Well, it's, it's really no surprise that human milk has the balance of nutrients that's uh, made for a human baby. So uh, our, again, the wisdom of our, our physiology knows how to do this. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble, but I have to, uh, I have to say this just because, again, I, I want to state for the record that the reason I even started this show is I, I love having smart conversations with, with, with intelligent, educated, experienced people. And I, I do keep my mind open to kind of anything anybody says, but um, I can't imagine, and most people I meet when we have a dairy conversation, I, I try to imagine uh, why, why not put human milk in your coffee or on your cereal uh, when it makes sense to put, makes sense with quotes around, to put on uh, cow's milk or goat's milk or, or a different kind of milk. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't think she'll mind if I tell this story, but many, many years ago, uh, my my absolute oldest, dearest friend in the whole world, she had to drop out of college because she had her first kid and we were hanging out and, and uh, she, she went into a different room and she pumped and then she came back out with, with this, this little baggie of human milk and, and she was just, she just said, well, we're just gonna throw it away, but I had to pump and whatever. And I made a joke, I was like 19 or 20, I made a joke that, uh, that I, was gonna, I was gonna drink it because I was a kid, I was being, I was being a smart ass. And she, and she gave it to me and, and she was like, here, drink it, I dare you. <laughs> and uh, and I, I got it up to like my face and I, I, I didn't throw up, but I was so yeah. overwhelmed by the idea that it was not only milk, it was my friend's milk. <laughs> and, and she busted my chops for it for years yeah, about yeah. that. And it wasn't until many years later that I first heard somebody say what you just said that I thought, I remembered that story and I thought, man, 
Like, isn't that a little, that's a little funny that like as a human, the idea of drinking human's milk is so repulsive to me, but isn't it kind of funny that there's this other milk, but we were just, we were raised that it does a body good. It's really, really good for us. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about eggs for a minute. This is one where a lot of people Mm -hmm. kind of get hung up. Uh, I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan, despite the fact that he is fairly anti-psychiatry, it seems like, and fairly anti-plant-based stuff. Uh, But his big thing is, you know, where where vegans and vegetarians get it right is they're they're against sort of factory farming, but he's got backyard chickens and eggs are just free food. You know, uh, they're... um, they are full of really good protein and amino acids. Um, what about eggs, Carol? Well, they're also very high in cholesterol. And despite what is popular in the media these days, it still does promote atherosclerosis, which is heart disease. So, and, and you don't need that cholesterol. Your liver is going to make the cholesterol that it needs. You do not need to take in any from any source, not from eggs, not from dairy, and so forth, and certainly not from meat. So you do not need to have that. And it's deleterious to your health to be consuming uh, cholesterol. It will elevate your cholesterol levels and increase your risk for heart disease. So dietary cholesterol does <clears throat> does elevate cholesterol? Mm-hmm, it does. Okay. So I've, I've read things on, on both sides uh, that say dietary cholesterol does not elevate cholesterol that, 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 that saturated fat elevates your body's lipid levels and so forth. So you have to look at who paid for the research for these kinds of things. So I suppose that the Egg Council was involved possibly in the paying for the research for some of these uh, um, outcomes that indicate that it's okay to eat eggs. Well, of course, it's like the dairy industry and the livestock industry will uh, pay for research projects to get the results that they want. Yes, you've always got to look at the funding source on, right. on, on, on either side. Um, one of the things that Dr. Michael Greger jokes about is, is someday when Big Broccoli gets a lot of money, we're going to have to uh, to watch out for some of the studies. Let's talk about saturated <clears throat> fat for a minute. This is another one that, um, and again, big fan, but uh, Joe Rogan and some of his favorite people like Chris Kresser and so forth will talk about that saturated fat got blamed uh, when the sugar, and we're going to talk about sugar in a minute when the sugar industry wanted to do a sleight of hand and the saturated fat is really not bad for you, it's critical for your body to make all the different hormones and so forth. Not necessarily what I've read, uh, mm-hmm. registered dietitian, expert nutritionist for many years, saturated fat, uh, both plant-based and animal-based, good or well, bad, you, you, go. shouldn't, you shouldn't be eating any of it. Uh, as I started out saying, there's fat in all foods, and it's, and it's a minimal amount of fat. That's all your body needs. Your liver knows what to do with it. So it's going to be able to create uh, hormones, you know, every other factor that's involved in human physiology where there's fat, where there's a, an indication of fat benefit. That's all you need in those, in those products. You do not need to take in any additional fat. Besides, any kind of oil is going to be a, a processed food. So back to the soybean for an example. So if you extract soybean oil and you concentrate it and if you buy a, buy a jar, there's really no nutrition except there, uh, there's fat and fat calories. A few trace vitamins and minerals, but very, very few. So the benefit is gonna be in the real whole soy product. And that's true for olive oil and you know, any of the oils that you wanna talk about. It's been ext- extracted from the original whole food and you should be eating the whole food, not the extracted oil. So you eat olives, not olive oil. You eat coconuts, not coconut oil. Coconut oil is is a big one. My wife is from Fairfield, which if anyone uh, listening doesn't know about Fairfield, Iowa, it's where the the Transcendental Meditation Movement is sort of headquartered in America. They took over a college, and it's called Maharishi School of Management, and so. Um, uh, coconut oil is sort of seen almost uh, in this mythical mm-hmm. healing sort of way uh, that it, it sort of can cure everything. And uh, eating coconut oil, whether it's bulletproof coffee, uh, whether it's, um, what do they call it, when they, they rinse their mouths out with it. Oh, I just, I had it in my head, I just lost it. You know, but it, there's a lot of people definitely believe that MCT oils and mm-hmm. coconut oils are is super, super healthy for you. What say you? Well, if you want to put coconut oil on your skin, that's one thing, but you should not ingest it. It's uh, too high in saturated fat, 92%. And again, it's uh, going to raise uh, LDL cholesterol, which is a factor in um, um, uh, cardiovascular disease. 
So it, I would say a big no to coconut. If you want to use coconut water, that does not have any fat in it. You, if you get the coconut flavor, you can use that in cooking and so forth if you want to. Uh, or if you, if you absolutely have to have coconut, you know, a little bit of shredded coconut as a flavoring agent, but to use it as a cooking oil or uh, an ingredient in anything, I would say no. So you would be in favor of eating avocados um, as an example, uh, but just to follow your line, and then avocado right. oil and anything you'd extract would, would not be as good. That's correct. So the avocado is a real food. food. It's a whole food. It, yes, it's high in fat, but that's naturally occurring uh, fat. So that would be acceptable, whereas uh, avoc avocado oil, unless you, if you ha absolutely have to use it, trace amounts. So um, I, I'm, there's, there's so much more I want to talk about. We're doing so well. We've got plenty of time, but um, I want to make sure we hit a couple of things. So before we transition uh, into, I want to talk about some of the other kind of popular diets. I think a lot of people are intrigued by the idea of what be it vegetarianism, veganism, a whole food plant-based diet. I think a lot of people say, oh my God, I'm just going to be eating salads all day long. Uh, I don't like tofu. Um, give us, what's your favorite breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Oh my gosh, that's... <laughs> give us a couple if you can't okay. pick. Okay, so pretty much for every, every day for breakfast. Well, there are a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, I will have um, oatmeal, um, rolled oats, not the, not the uh, instant oats. So I'll cook up my oatmeal. I will put a tablespoon of ground flaxseed, a tablespoon of uh, walnuts in that, um, uh, blueberries, about a half a cup of blueberries, and then I will use uh, soy milk to thin it down to the consistency that I like. And then I drink a glass of soy milk as well. And I always have an orange, a fresh orange, not orange juice, a fresh orange for breakfast. Um, that pretty much takes care of my usual breakfast. Okay. Uh, if I want something different, I'll do, a, well, this, this, I'm kind of intrigued by this just egg because I really enjoyed that omelet that I made last week. So that would be kind of a special treat, but I would have it with a whole grain bread. Okay. Uh, and um, I cooked it up with uh, onions and mushrooms, which are whole foods, uh, and had this wonderful omelet. And I did have a little bit of the uh, new cheese, the brand name was called Veal Life. Uh, shredded, shredded cheddar uh, product that's really quite good. So that would be a treat. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I do for my uh, breakfast. Okay. And, and so, I mean, uh, I, there's this, and this is where I, I, maybe we'll get back to the, I talked about the PR problem. I think there's this view that it's, um, it's not manly or something if you're, if you're not eating meat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that comes from this, maybe this evolutionary perspective or the idea that we're sort of meat eaters. So the, the breakfast foods, um, what would be, just gi give, us, give us one sort of uh, non-breakfasty entree, like uh, what would be one that you might cook at your house that would be a, a dinner or a lunch type oh, meal? Um, well, I always have tons of vegetables in my refrigerator. I, I have probably 10 different kinds and I'm always making up a salad. So I oftentimes will have a salad for lunch. And what I like to do is to put uh, edamame soybeans, which I buy frozen. So I'll sprinkle those and that, the, uh, over the salad. And that's, that gives it a little bit more substance. It's gonna stay, a little, stay with you a little bit longer because it's more of a concentrated source of uh, fiber and protein. Um, and then I, I've gotten to the point where I really like to make my own salad dressings. So that's the, those would be from Whole Foods. I do not put oil in them. L let me try to hit some some objections. I can already hear people uh, typing onto my mm. Twitter feed. Um, <laughs> so that sounds like it takes a lot of time. Uh, rolled oats as opposed to quick oats. Uh, make my own salad dressing. Uh, uh, but Carol, uh, I completely agree with you. But I don't have time to eat like this. What say you? Well, you need to have a look at how you're spending your time. Is is that what do you what are you doing with your time that? is more important than eating properly, eating good food. It takes me about 15 minutes to put that breakfast together in the morning. It's not a long period of time. And it's very healthy. And it's, um, you know, otherwise, what do you do? Open a box of cereal of, that's highly processed and pour cow's milk on it, and that's breakfast? That's not a good route to go. So uh, if this is important to you, you will find the time to do it. Um, salad dressings usually take maybe four or five ingredients at the most. You put them in a shaker, and you've got salad dressing for, a, well, probably a week at least. I make up a really large salad uh, every time I make them. It, makes me, it takes me about a half an hour <coughs> to make a large salad. And um, yeah, it's, and then I, I eat it for three days probably at least. So it's always available. So that's my fast food is the salad, the large salad that I've made up and I have it for a few days. 
Objection number two. This sounds like first world privilege to me. How could I possibly afford uh, to eat on a diet like this? The most, the most expensive thing that you will find in the supermarket is meat. Meat, fish, poultry. Uh, and you take those out of the diet, and you compare the price of those to things like the, a very basic fundamental vegan diet type of a menu item would be rice and beans. That's been going on for eons. Rice and beans, rice and beans. It's healthy, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's easy to prepare, and you can make all kinds of modifications in the taste and so forth too. So those are, they're extremely inexpensive. As I said, the most expensive thing in the supermarket is the meat, fish, and poultry. So you're going to save money. You can eat really uh, healthfully uh, on, a, on a plant-based diet. Save some money. If you go on a plant-based diet, don't you have to supplement with a whole bunch of uh, other things? No, uh, as far as vitamins and minerals and so forth are concerned, or? Yeah, you know, so I'm imagining, uh, again, just sort of excuses that people would say, like, uh, everybody seems to know somebody that went on a, a plant-based diet and they just, oh, they were so weak and they got all frail and, you know, their hair was falling out and their doctors had to put them on all these different supplements. Mm -hmm. And of course, when, if, if it's not protein that's the objection, it's B12 usually mm -hmm. comes up but besides. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's just, for everyone knows, right, that, that vegetarians and vegans have to supplement with B12. Are there a bunch of other things you have to supplement with? Uh, what, what is it? So, Chris Kresser always talks about is selenium or something yeah. else that like, yeah. oh my God, you gotta have <clears throat> eggs because you're not gonna have enough no. chromium or something. Yeah, like, if you're, if you're, sel selenium is one that's found in nuts. So if you're eating nuts, which are a whole food, you know, you're gonna get selenium. Um, the, the issue as far as uh, vitamin B12 for an example, uh, what I recommend that people do is before they start supplementing with B12 is to have their level checked, find out what their blood level of B12 is. It's a very simple test, uh, your insurance will probably pay for it, find out where you are. And then you can decide uh, if you need to supplement or if you don't. Uh, just as an example, um, well, the, the, the range is uh, 325 micrograms to 800 micrograms is what the desired level is typically for, for most people. So uh, I've been supplementing as a good vegan would. And so I had my test and it was like 1800. It was like way higher than it needed to be. So I quit taking B12 and it, it took probably a couple of years to get it back down into what would be an 800 high normal range. Wow. So, so check it first. It's an important nutrient, check it. Uh, there are some uh, foods like uh, nutritional yeast would be an example where you can get some of that. But remember, the B12 is found in meat not because it is made by the animal. B12 is found in animal products because the animals eat soil and it's in soil, it's a bacteria, it's made by a bacteria that's in soil. So animals don't make it either, they just happen to have it because they eat dirt. Right. Besides protein and besides the incomplete protein myth which was disproved in the 70s from everything I've read, <laughs> another one that always pops up is soy is bad for you because of phytoestrogens and um, especially Actually, I've never heard a woman object to that. Men will talk about uh, the estrogen is going to be bad for you, whether it's mm -hmm. it's gynecomastia, <laughs> which is the doctor word for man boobs, mm -hmm. or it's going to make you less virile or something like that. Um, what would you advise if someone has soy concerns? Yeah. Well, as far as women are concerned, um, as far as, even if, if women have had breast cancer, it is still advisable for them to eat real soy, not soy isolate, but to include soy products because that can actually block uh, the action, the, the deleterious action uh, in this, at a cellular level. So it's actually protected. The phytoestrogen that found, it's found in soy is uh, beneficial. Um, as far as uh, the, uh, the, the man boob business or uh, uh, the threat of impotence and so forth, I posed that, to, uh, that question to Dr. Mark Messina, who is like the leading soy researcher several years ago. And he says, you know, they eat a lot of soy in China. And I don't think that there's a, <laughs> I don't think there's a fertility issue. <laughs> Over a billion people. <laughs> yes. So uh, that kind of took the wind out of that, uh, that question. I read an interesting study not that long ago out of Japan where they were actually prescribing, with quotes around it, whole soy for women uh, that are perimenopausal for, <clears throat> for hot flashes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the giving exogenous chemicals uh, to women that are that are menopausal uh, can have some issues there, but it's but eating this soy uh, greatly improved uh, right. their suffering with hot flashes, mm -hmm. and it was just and it wasn't that many servings a day, as I recall. Have you have you ran into that at all with hot flashes? Oh, absolutely. Women who uh, include soy in the diet report that they have uh, far fewer hot flashes, and they have a much uh, easier 
uh, transition in the, through menopause if they include soy in the diet. I, I want to make sure that we talk about two things before uh, when we talk about the other popular diets, because it's all going to feed in there. So, so far, we've talked extensively about protein. You, you uh, very nicely uh, brought fats involved. The most demonized macronutrient by far is carbohydrate. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that So <laughs> you, you know, you talked about rolled oats. You talked about uh, you know, a, a whole grain bread, if I'm going to eat a, an omelet, you know, carbohydrates, uh, aren't carbohydrates the enemy? They'll make you fat, their body turns them into sugar. Uh, carbohydrates, Carol, what do we do what, about carbs? One, one of the most uh, fundamental uh, facts in nutrition is that the human body needs to have about 135 grams of carbohydrate every day. And cells run on carbohydrate. They, well, I, let me back up. Cells run on glucose. Glucose comes from carbohydrate. You need uh, glucose. The best source is carbohydrates. And it's interesting that we like carbohydrates. So it's like your body's wisdom is saying, bring on some carbohydrates because that's what I need. The problem is that people are using a lot, of, well, excessive amounts, and most of it's processed. So mm. you know, your sugars and your white flours and those highly processed types of things. But carbohydrates from fruits and vegetables, whole grains are, uh, are fine to include. So uh, 135 grams per day, that's about nine servings. You know, so three servings per day, three servings per meal would give you your nine servings. So there are some issues, of course, with gluten sensitivity. You know, there's the celiac, uh, the people who are dealing with celiac uh, sprue uh, intolerance of, of uh, gluten. They need to be very careful about what they choose, but there are some non-glutinous uh, grains that can be used too. Uh, some people notice that if they're eating gluten-containing foods that they have joint issues. Mm. But, but they should not take off the table all of the grains just because, you know, it's, it's, it's it's unwise to say all grains are bad because they absolutely are not. You have to be selective and, and you know, find the ones that you, that you like and that you tolerate well. And if you find that wheat containing uh, uh, products don't do well for you, some people say that they have joint issues with, if they're eating gluten types of foods without having celiac disease. So you kind of have, have to check that out, but uh, uh, you, know, you can have grains. There's so many interesting studies about people that sort of believe they have gluten sensitivities that, that really mm -hmm. don't, but we don't mm -hmm. want to be too flippant because there obviously mm -hmm. are people that really do. Mm -hmm. So give us a couple of things that you think people should be eating in terms of uh, grains and good quality carbohydrates. Uh, so that way, if people are listening to this mm -hmm. and thinking, I'm going to give this a shot, you know, I already heard about the, the, some of the, the protein sources that are okay. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the, the carbohydrate sources that you would recommend? Well, I, re I really like quinoa. It's a grain that uh, has lots of, uh, of uh, good properties and beneficial properties and so forth. Again, anything that's a whole grain and it's more in the like the you know the brown rice or the teff or you know some of these other uh, either ancient grains or uh, grains that have been around well whether they're Aztec ancient Aztec, ancient Aztec grains or uh, grains that are uh, common in the Middle East uh, but we want to get away from a lot of the highly processed types of things that that's so pervasive in the United States. <clears throat> Uh, you know, rice is a very neutral grain, but there's not a whole lot of nutrition in rice. You know, if you are going to eat rice, you want to eat uh, brown rice. And uh, there's also the issue of arsenic in rice. So one of the things that you can do to uh, avoid that problem is to cook rice in a lot of water. That leaches the arsenic out of the rice. But then again, you don't want to have a diet that's all rice. You know, get some variety in there. Even if you like rice, that's, you know, having some occasionally is fine. But there are other grains that have much more, uh, a, a, a better nutrition profile. I, I asked a, a dietitian once about rice and um, he, he said similar things to what you said. Uh, there's black rice and red rice and there's a variety. Mm -hmm. and, but then he also said if, if there was so much arsenic, uh, Japan, India, <laughs> exactly. China, we would have a lot of dead people. Right, There'd right. be a lot of arsenic poisoning uh, right. sort of around the world. Yeah. This, this conversation leads us beautifully into the talk about sugar. Mm -hmm. um, there certainly is a, a lot of belief that you know, the sugar industry, you, know, you hear about uh, the tobacco industry kind of went into big food and processed food. Mm -hmm. uh, they use the same playbook that the tobacco mm -hmm. industry did. Um, and then you get people that are kind of on 
again, the sort of the Joe Rogan t uh, slant of if you're eating grass-fed beef, wild game, you know, those are great protein sources because it's not factory farmed. And then it's, it's really about sugar. So all these studies we've been talking about, all these people that have showed heart disease reversal and so forth, isn't it just that they're helping people uh, not eat as much sugar and mm -hmm. sugar is really the culprit, not, not meats and all of that? Well, sugar is a highly processed food, and it's very dense in calories, and so that's not very helpful when people are, are uh, struggling with uh, weight issues. Uh, we don't need to have that concentrated uh, sweetener. It's one of those things that's kind of addictive, so once you start eating a lot of sugar, uh, you want more and more, and it's really hard to cut back on it. But we, you can wean yourself off very successfully just by going to a, a, a minimal level. So uh, sugar, is, is, it can be pro-inflammatory, which is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's mostly because it's in junk food with, along with white sugar and fat and so forth. So it's really good to get the sugar out of the diet. So you, you, do, you decrease your calories, you decrease your risk for inflammation issues and so forth. Are, are there some sweeteners that are better than others or not, not really? Well, they're all, they're all sugar. I mean, they all boil, literally boil down to sugar. Uh, I, if I need to have some kind of sweetener, I use agave nectar. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a fructose, it's mostly fructose, but you know, a small amount, it's, your body can handle that okay. What's your body's designed to handle these types of sugars. I mean, they're glu it's glucose. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to have a whole lot of it. What's your take on, on artificial sweeteners? Stay away from them. For, um, from, from all oh, of them? Yeah, I would stay away from all of them. Uh, they're, they're not... Uh, they're not a natural food. Your liver doesn't really know what to do with them. And it's interesting that people who do artificial sweeteners, they often still have weight problems. So it's almost as if you're tasting something. If you have the taste mm -hmm. of something sweet in your mouth, it translates into issues as far as weight are concerned. It, makes, it, it, it doesn't make sense, but that's what the research is showing. So uh, I, can, I can definitely attest to the fact that uh, being Somebody who, who I, I like my soda, uh, and, and I, have, I grew up drinking diet soda, you'll hear people say uh, it'll make you hungrier. That's, that's true for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you hear people say, oh, it's an insulin spike, it's a whatever else. It may just be something sweet. Those of you not watching on YouTube, Cooper and I are, are drinking zero sugar monster energy drinks while Carol's drinking water. Uh, <laughs> so we know uh, who's the healthiest person, and it's not the 24-year-old in the room. Uh, it, it's obviously the uh, the person who's older than that. Um, so, what about stevia? Do you have an opinion, opinion on stevia? Well, it's it's from a plant, so that's a good thing. But it still is very highly processed. I mean, you can you can grow your own stevia plants and you know clip off a leaf and sweeten your tea or whatever if you want to do that. That would be a better way to do it. I like I like stevia. I have to admit, I I sort of moved myself into stevia not long ago, and you know, there's the the soda you can get called Zevia. Uh, which is not a sponsor of this program, although like I said about Old Capital Tofu, I would be open to that idea. But um, I, I kind of like that. Uh, it took me a while to get the taste of it in my mouth. It's different than Diet Coke and so mm -hmm. forth, but um, everything I've read about Stevia is that it, it's I haven't seen anything negative per se. Uh, there's a, you know who I'm talking about, but the, the researcher uh, and uh, personality named Michael Greger has sort of given that one the green light, as well as something called date sugar, which mm -hmm. is just pulverized dates, mm -hmm. but that uh, that has calories in it versus mm -hmm. something like stevia, which but it's a real food. It's does a whole not, food. It's a whole food yeah. in that way. So, mm -hmm. but, but so in 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 the in the Carol Throckmorton plan, not even stevia. Just stay away. I I I'm very much into the whole food thing. It's like you know, don't, just wean yourself off of those kinds of things and say, okay, I I can do better than that. I don't I don't need those kinds of things. You know, I don't buy sodas, for an example. You don't have to buy sodas. You don't have to drink sodas. You you mentioned the addictive properties of sugar. We're going to have a guest on eventually. Uh, my friend, Dr. Heather Swada, who is. Uh, an eating disorder and body image specialist from Mount Mercy in Cedar Rapids, mm -hmm. Iowa. I'm gonna talk to her about this as well, but you know, do you think food addiction is a real thing? Do you think it's more, uh, more of a self-disciplinary thing? People that are overweight and can't seem to stop eating it? What's your take on that? Well, I think there are other issues that come into play and with your, in your field, I'm sure that you see this all the time. You know, it's like, let's go let's go below the surface here and find out what, what else is going on what emotional issues is a person dealing with what is their stress level you know did they experience abuse as a child are they ex experiencing abuse now so there are lots of other things that go on um, so those need to be explored uh, but there's you know we have the brain power to say I'm going to eat a whole food plant-based diet 
period. We can do that. We don't need to have all these other little crutches. So it's, it's one of those things where you just have to say, what's important to me? You know, what do I want my life to be like? And if you want to, to have a life that, where you're, you're feeling healthy and you have energy to do the things that you want to do, and you want to feel good about the foods that you're putting in your body, then this is the way to go. Carol Throckmorton, super hardcore. <laughs> um, I, I will say, uh, for the record, and, and I'll definitely talk more when we have Heather on eventually about this, that I, I've been kicking around this idea in my head of food addiction for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'll be 41 soon. I've been heavy pretty much my whole life. You are far too polite to say this, but since the last time I saw you, I've definitely put on weight. And um, it's as I uh, get more and more into my profession of psychiatry, and as I think about uh, people that are addicted to alcohol and tobacco and, and drugs, uh, you know, I see in myself more and more of the same sort of spectrum of symptoms when it comes to food that if I, and I did for a while, follow this very strict sort of whole food plant-based diet, I definitely felt better, I lost weight, I had lots of energy, and it was, it was easier than I would want to admit that I, it sort of snuck back in in my life with one thing here and one thing there and uh, then the, the craving of whether it was processed food or sugar or salt or fat or whatever it was, it hits me. I've never been addicted to alcohol or drugs or anything like that, but it's, it's what the textbooks say, what the people talk about. Uh, I think though that something like food addiction uh, is looked down upon because it's mm -hmm. like, oh, whatever, you're just fat and lazy and you don't, you just don't have good self-discipline, which is kind of why I asked about, about sort of your, your take mm -hmm. on it. You know, was it, is it, is it a disciplinary thing or is it, you know, is there actual that physical addictive property to the kind of foods that we all kind of love and know are, are bad mm -hmm. for us, so to speak? Well, if, there's, if, if your body has a, a physical addiction, it's because you need calories, you know. So one of the reasons why we eat is we get hungry, and your body is sending you a message to send down some food. So that, but to, to go into the addiction thing, I would say let's explore some other things that are going on here. So your body is going to tell you when it needs food. That's the hunger thing. And, and if you have foods in your house that are healthy, those are the things that you're going to eat. If you have foods in your house that are not healthy, you know, if you have the high sugar, high processed kinds of, you know, cookies and snacks and whatever, uh, that's what you're going to eat. If you don't, if it's not there, you're going to go for something else. So that's part of where the discipline comes in. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it, it's okay for your body to crave food <laughs> or have an addiction to food. That's, that, it's, that's a, not a very good use of that term, but um, you know that's that's one thing. But to to have an addiction that uh, you just don't seem to have control over, that's where I would say you need to explore some of the other things right. that are going on in a person's life. Right. There's a there's a, a bodybuilding nutritionist who's written several books that I like. His name is Lyle McDonald, and uh, he talks about food addiction and says something that I've been saying for a lot of years, which is I think I think food stuff is harder in some ways because you can go your entire life and never drink a drop of alcohol and you'll be fine. You can never smoke a cigarette. You can never shoot heroin. You can never sniff cocaine. But we all have to encounter food in, in some form. And of course, there's the social aspect. Mm -hmm. Every wedding, every funeral, every time we get together. I mean, we're, we're shooting in my studio right now and you walked in and I offered you a variety of things to drink. And of course, you took, you know, it took water because, uh, because, you're hardcore and I, I, I love it. Um, but I, I think it's an interesting topic and one that I'm, I'm excited to sort of explore more on this program and in mm -hmm. conversations I have with people just because I think it's so easy to sort of fall back into, into patterns and so forth, which is, I, I can guess what you're going to say to this, but um, I think there are people that would say, okay, I would be willing to move in the plant-based direction, but I want to still have meat twice a week or meatless Mondays maybe where we start or we uh, were vegetarian or vegan and during the week and then the weekends and so forth. I mean, do, do you do you think you should go whole hog, so to speak? I just or, realized, or cold turkey. I just realized, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, uh, cold tofurkey. Or um, uh, you know, is, is it better to sort of gradually go in? Should you flip the switch and now I'm a vegan? What do you think? 
it's, it's very individual on how a person wants to do this. A lot of people perceive this as being hard, and so for those folks, tiptoeing into it is probably the way that they're going to have to go. Um, I've worked with patients, and, and, well, and, and people will say, oh, I could never do that, or you know, I just can't understand why people can, can make this much of a change in the way that they eat. I've seen people do it overnight. I mean, I did it overnight. I, on December 31st of, two, of 1993, I was omnivore. The next day, I was vegetarian. I've seen heart patients. You know, if you have your chest broken open and you have um, uh, the bypass surgery procedure or you know whatever is necessary for that, you're pretty highly motivated to make some changes. You know, if your doctor or if your dietitian or your family member says, "I think that there's something wrong with our diet that we need to change," you're highly motivated to do it because you do not want to go back in that surgical suite and have more bypass uh, procedures or stents or whatever. People are highly motivated. People can do it overnight. It is not difficult, and it's better to do it overnight. And people will say, "Oh, you know, the first three days. You know, the first three days, I just didn't feel very good, and I don't think this is right for me." Well, your body is getting. If if you're eating a plant-based diet, your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It's getting rid of toxins from what you were eating before. So if you have that period, that little transition period when you don't feel like you're mm. quite normal, give it a, give it some more time because your body's going to, uh, you know, kind of wind its way through that, and uh, yeah. you'll you'll come out on the other side with more energy. You'll feel better, and if you're overweight, you'll lose weight. I also think one of the issues that comes up is caloric density. So you know, a, a huge. A uh, bowl of salad does not have uh, very many calories compared mm. to a not very big hamburger. And I think people transition and they go from eating, just for the sake of math, 3,000 calories a day to 1,500 mm. calories a day. And then they go, oh my God, I was so tired and I was felt so weak and I didn't have any mm. energy. I couldn't focus. Mm. But if you cut your calories to 1,500 calories a day, regardless of what you were eating, especially for a sort of a normal adult-sized person, mm -hmm. I think that would be, uh, that, that would certainly affect your energy levels right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that can be a piece of it too, and people are transitioning. Mm -hmm. And doing your homework, uh, like you said, uh, n knowing what are the things that I can have, it opens up this mm -hmm. whole new world, uh, you know, how do I cook with, uh, without meat as the, the flavor adder, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I think that can be big too. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people are pretty much addicted to meat. Uh, they've had it in their life for so long they can imagine they cannot imagine not eating meat, and that's a bit of an obstacle for them too. Uh, so, I, and I think that's one of the things that really keeps people is that they like the taste of meat. You know, it's not good for them. It's not good for the environment. It's certainly not good for the animals. So, making that choice and saying, "Okay, I am going to I'm going to go down a different path here," is a very important thing. Yeah. And people do feel better. I've across the board people find out when they are eating a whole food plant-based diet that they feel better. So let's let's talk about some of the popular diets that are big right now and we're going I think we'll be able to go through several of them quickly because there's so many mm -hmm. similarities. You just mentioned uh, people feel better, people lose weight, but you can hear that about the other popular diets mm -hmm. too. It feels to me and this is not a scientific uh, poll by any means, but when I read things either online or I listen to programs, the ketogenic diet seems like it's the really hot one right now. Mm -hmm. So define it quickly for us and then what's your take on the ketogenic diet? Well, I can pretty much across the board about these diets. So back to the energy point, when people go on a diet, and you know, in our culture, people, it's like I, they have to be on a, a diet. It's whatever the fad diet is. Gluten-free was a, a, a big one too. It's like, okay, I'm going to go on this gluten-free diet that's going to solve all my problems. There's always so the hot thing, yeah, right? It's yeah. Some diet I have to be engaged in. Well, if people start feeling better, even if it's a if if it's a paleo diet for Pete's sake, you know they feel better because they can't eat all of that junk food on that diet that they were eating before. So it's not that they feel better because they're eating the paleo diet. They feel better because they're not eating all the bad stuff. <laughs> And the same is true with the keto diet. Neither of those are healthy. Number one, there is no true paleo diet. You know, this paleo diet is named after our ancestors, our ancient ancestors. We don't even have today the foods that they ate. So mm -hmm. it's not possible to have an authentic, genuine paleo diet today because the foods are not there. Uh, people just need to stop <laughs> doing this, this diet business, getting on a diet and they just eat whole food, plant-based diet, and that's the way to go. It makes their life way simpler. You don't have to count things and record things and you know measure stuff and so forth and, and buy a whole refrigerator full of new food to go mm -hmm. on this particular diet. Just eat 
real food that looked like it was once attached to the earth. It's very simple. Nutrition does not have to be complex. People want to make it complex, and especially the people who want to make money off of the industry, they want to make it complex. It is not complex. You can make a lot of money, I've heard people say, by telling people that their bad habits are okay. Right. You know, and there was, there were many sort of cigarette campaigns long before my time that it was like, m most doctors smoke this one. Or, you know, I, I remember as a, as a boy, my babysitter got pregnant and I remember my mother talking to her and she said, my doctor told me if I keep it to less than a pack a day, it'll be okay. And that would have been in the mid 80s. And of course, now we would never say that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, it, it seems like so we, we covered. So keto and paleo and Atkins are basically mm -hmm. all low carb diets, right. high protein, low carb, high protein, low carb. Mm -hmm. And they basically by cutting out grains and, and so forth. The the one that really gets me even when and I, I, I never going to lie uh, about my diet history. I was low carb for a long time, lost weight, never could break through a certain plateau. The, what, the thing that never made sense to me was you can't eat fruit. And th that never seemed right to me. Back to my mother's mm -hmm. statement about dairy being a very natural mm -hmm. food. It, it always occurred to me in the low carb days. That just doesn't seem right uh you know the, well, the, the right. <laughs> fruit is the fruit is bad and yeah. and uh, I, I love to tell this story there, there's there's a youtube video of this this bodybuilder guy and he's totally shredded and he has a kit kat bar in one hand and an apple and he goes bro do you know there's more sugar in this apple than there is this kit kat you'd be better off eating this kit kat than you would this apple and i think to myself that's insane. Like, what, how, what in the world? How could people actually think that? Yeah. How many hundreds of nutrients are there in the apple that are not in that Kit Kat bar? I, uh, so it, it, it makes no sense. The other thing is we like variety in our diet. So if you take out a food group like fruit, you know, you're, it's, there's, it's like there's something missing. Uh, you know, you take dairy out of the diet, you've got other alternatives. You've got the plant milk, so sure. that's going to fill that. And, and like I say, people like variety. I usually have, you know, uh, some type of uh, vegetables, a, a lot of vegetables, I have a, a fruit, and then, you know, whatever else, I, maybe a grain uh, is part of my meal. So I have at least three things. I find that if I have less, if I have two things, I, have, I never eat just one thing. If I have two things, it's like, mm, there's something missing here. It's like I have to have three different food groups. Well, that's kind of an intuitive way that our bodies say we need to have these things coming in. So yeah. we like variety. Yeah. One of our Facebook questions was about the Atkins diet, which is mm -hmm. also, you know, a, a, a low carb sort of high protein mm -hmm. diet. And the person asked, uh, why is it that a diet like that would be recommended when somebody already has high cholesterol or, or high, high lipids? Uh, well, it should never be recommended. <laughs> There was, back in the 1990s, this is when I was uh, still working at uh, Mercy Medical Center in Des Moines and so forth, and you know, the physicians, the cardiologists were recommending their patients go on these Atkins diets, Atkins diets, uh, and it was mostly for weight loss. So they need to lose weight, it looks like the Atkins diet is going to promote weight loss. It was like the worst diet in the world. And I had patients who would come through cardiac rehab, well, tell me about your diet. Well, I was on the Atkins diet. <laughs> Nobody should be on the Atkins diet. Nobody should be on a high protein, low carb diet. Those are high fat diets too. So that's not what your physiology wants. The other thing I want to say for sure is that you know, earlier I said you need 135 grams of carbohydrate every day. If you're not taking that in, your liver has to create it. So if you're on a, a, a low carb, high protein, high fat diet, and you're only taking, and I think Atkins was like maybe 15 grams of carbohydrate per day, your body doesn't go without carbohydrate, the glucose. It will convert protein into glucose because it has to have it. So instead of depriving yourself of these, of these beneficial carbohydrates, why don't you just eat them and enjoy them and, and give your liver a break? <laughs> Sure. If anybody wants to Google that, the term is gluconeogenesis. That's See, I can right. prove to people actually went to medical school <laughs> by using fancy doctor words. Uh, but so, uh, but an argument would be: what you want to do is you want to turn your body into a fat-burning machine, and the way to do that is to get into ketosis. So, by by limiting carbohydrates, mm -hmm. by eating fats, by eating proteins, which which like animal-based proteins have no carbohydrates in them unless they're covered in panko breadcrumbs or yeah, something yeah. that you're, so there's, you're there's glycogen in meat there's always there's, a, there's some carbohydrate sure in sure but the, the goal glycogen. is to get into ketosis because then you become mm -hmm. a fat burning machine and you hear stories about athletes that have 
boundless energy because they've got we, we've got so much fat on our body and therefore uh, the ketotic state is the preferred one it's absolutely not your first pro your, your body's first desire is to you know, in, in like the, the the number one metabolic process is for glucose your body has a secondary way that it can uh, use calorie it can um, maintain itself is through ketosis. That is not a healthy way to do that. Mm. So it is a backup system. It is not your primary metabolic process that should be uh, taking place. So instead of, uh, you know, observing fad diets and so forth and depriving yourself of things, and it's like there's a whole um, uh, mental health thing that comes into that uh, uh, part of it too. You know, just stop doing all of those crazy diets and just eat real food. It's so simple and it's so beneficial. One of the things I think is, is interesting, and I've, I've done a lot of reading about, is intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. um, I have been trying to think of a way to phrase this for the last hour and a half that will not be insulting, because I'm not calling you old. Um, <laughs> I, I like the fact you've been in the business for a while, because you've seen things come and go in different iterations multiple times. Yes. I've been paying attention to diet for 20 years, and in the time I've paid attention, it was Atkins Protein Power. That was the first one I followed. Mm -hmm. And then it went away for a bit, and then it came back as Keto Paleo. And so uh, I think intermittent fasting as well as had sort of multiple iterations. Um, Jason Fung, who is a Canadian, I think he's a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, He's sort of seen as being the scientist promoting that, but there are a million bros out there, and uh, Rhonda Patrick, who I mentioned, has been on Joe Rogan's program, talks about intermittent fasting. There are a thousand versions. The time-restricted window, uh, the alternate day fasting, where you fast mm -hmm. every other day, the mm -hmm. extended fasts. Do you have any opinion on oh, absolutely. fasting? <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. I, you, you're a fantastic <laughs> guest. You are absolutely invited back. You, listen, you, you call me you, you, anytime you want to come back. Come, hit me, intermittent fasting. Okay, so uh, your body wants nutrients about every four to five waking hours. That's why you get hungry. So you get up in the morning and you have breakfast. That's going to fuel your body for those morning hours. So around noontime, you start getting hungry. It's like, okay, your body's trying to tell you I need some more fuel. So, and this goes on throughout the day. And, and so, so you want to honor that part of your physiology that says, I need fuel, send down some good nutrients for me. So that's an important part. So I am not into this fasting business at all. This, uh, if you want to do an intermittent fast, and it's like from 12 p.m., like you, know, you stop eating after your dinner meal, and you don't eat anything until your breakfast meal the next day, I don't have a problem with that. That's, so tw 12 p.m. is, yeah. is noon, 12, I'm, I'm 12 a.m. When, when you're asleep, yeah. you're saying. No, it's, last meal, at, at, you know, you start this fast after 6 p.m. for your dinner meal, and then you don't eat anything until breakfast the next day. So that's a 12-hour fast. Sure. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. It's almost, you know, we kind of do that anyway. Well, the, the name of the meal is break fast. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. okay. And your body needs fuel first thing in the morning. There's just hands down. There's your... You've, you've, you've already fasted for X number of hours because you've been asleep. So your body needs to have fuel so that it can get going in the morning if you want to be productive. And we know, and from studies that have been done on adults and for kids, they, the performance, mental performance is much uh, stronger if they have breakfast. And it's because they're fueling up their body. So the idea of, I'm going to lump fasting into two categories right now. The two the two that I see as being the most popular. One is the eating window, and they have a variety of names that I'm just, I, I, I roll my eyes to say them. But they, they put, so it's like, I'm gonna eat only within a six hour, a four hour, a two hour window. As far as you're concerned, that's just, uh, it's rigmarole and, and it's, it's just too it's, complicated. It's, it's for, ridiculous. Okay. And again, it's, a, it's trying to follow a fad diet of one variety or not. It's another version of a fad diet. I definitely don't recommend that people go for you know a day or two or three or four days without food. There's water fasts and all that kind of thing. I do not recommend that at all. That was number two that I was going to ask about. <laughs> um, so so not and you'll hear people talk about the benefits of that. Um, you know, uh, autophagy, which is spelled with an A. If any of you are going to look it up, it looks like autophagy. Uh, the idea that your body uh, sort of cleans up. Uh, old crap that it doesn't need in it, uh, you know, even even uh, some plant-based people. There's a, a group in California, I think it's in Santa Rosa, called True North Health Center, Alan Goldhammer and Michael Clapper, who are both 
mm-hmm. whole food plant-based doctors, they at the True North Health Center will do water fasting protocols from a week to a month. And they talk about uh, this sort of the autophagy and also um, the body's ability to kind of heal itself. Is, is, there, is there merit in that? I, I don't think there is. And okay. again, the human body is designed to take care of itself. You know, this business about uh, wanting to, to flush the system. You know, I take this because it flushes me out. Well, or, um, you know, there's some people are doing these crazy enemas and so forth. Just leave your colon alone. Your li- it's a self-cleaning organ. <laughs> your whole system is self-cleaning. That's assuming that you're putting in healthy in- healthy nutrients. It'll, it'll take care of itself. Your body knows what to do. There's body wisdom that we need to be paying attention to. Carol Throckmorton is anti-enema, uh, for the record. <laughs> so down in Fairfield, where my wife is from, there's the big resort where Oprah stays and yeah. Hugh Jackman yeah. and everything's called The Raj. Yeah. And the owner of The Raj is a super duper cool guy that I would love to get on the program. So shout out Rogers Badgett. If we could ever get you on the show, that'd be great. But they do a lot of, they, they have fancy names for them, but they're enemas. And uh, it's the one thing, that's not true, there are many things, but of, of the many things I would probably never, ever do for my health, I'm so glad to hear you say that because <laughs> I do not want to have to do that. So uh, I, and, and I guess physiologically speaking, I, I, don't, I don't really see how it would be all that beneficial, although I, I think people just like to do things that sort of make themselves feel cleaner or, or something like that. Well, and there's always somebody that's ready to sell you a procedure. Correct. <laughs> and give you a, a hefty bill for doing so. There, there's a great story that was in the, the local news. Jim Carrey was in Fairfield doing all kinds of protocols and he got so tired of it, he went to a local Burger King for an ice cream cone and there, there was, a, there was a, a kid's baseball team there. Mm-hmm. He took pictures with them, so that was actually uh, in, in the news. You know, um, I think something that you said that's important, because you know, I've done a, a lot of reading on the fasting thing, I've done a bunch of it myself, um, I found some of the things that the researchers will talk about to happen to me, and I, I fully admit that myself within myself is an N of one, so I'm, I'm hardly a population study in myself. But, um, you know, is that, uh, and this is something that I've heard Dr. Clapper say on interviews, is that the most important thing is what are you going to eat afterwards? You know, so regardless of what kind of a cleanse you think you're doing, uh, if you go back to eating an unhealthy diet, all those benefits are going to go away almost immediately. You know, and certainly they at True North recommend mm-hmm. this this whole food plant based diet, and mm-hmm. kind of because then you're sort of flooding your body with with nutrients. And uh, just to finish that story, what people will say if you read about fasting is, oh, I was I was really hungry for the first day, and then three or four days in, I mm-hmm. just got this surge of energy. And uh, they, they talk about evolution, which is at that point, your, your senses are heightened because your body's mm-hmm. looking for food and so forth. And uh, during the protocol I was doing for the movie that I was shooting, that's when I, that's not, actually not when I first met you, when I first became sort of friends with you, because I, I met you back in, uh, in residency during the cardiac mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. I never felt the surge of energy uh, three or four days in. Uh, and I attributed that to the fact that I was eating this, this very healthy diet and mm. I, I wonder if you're eating like crap all the time, if you fast for a couple of days, you do feel better because it gave your body a chance to get some of that nonsense sort of process through. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's sort of a theory I had when I was mm. shooting the movie. Well, even, even if you are doing a fast, you know, your body's not going out without um, uh, sources of glucose because you know, you're not taking in any food, so you're not getting any glucose in, but your liver is still producing glucose through the gluconeogenesis process from fat. It's not a very efficient way to do it, but it can be done. So that's one of the survival strategies that our bodies have. Yeah, yeah. So let's see, um, we, you did such a beautiful job of covering some of the things I want to talk about. Here is something that you, I, you touched on, but I, I, I want wanted to get asked. It seems like Everyone is wanting to lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. But in my experience as a physician and as somebody who's been heavy, losing weight is not the trick. Maintaining the weight loss is, I was trying to think of a percentage, 90%, 95% of the the trick. Um, What would be your strategies for, because people will say, I lost weight with keto, I lost weight with paleo, and like you just said, you're you're cutting out these processed foods and so forth. How, how well, do, and then they, how, go then, ahead. Then they, when they've, uh, they, they don't want to be on these diets forever. So when they stop the diets, they go back to some old eating behaviors and then they end up picking back the weight up again. So that's one of the things that happens yeah. with that. So, so, so what do we do? How do we maintain 
the weight loss uh, that we so desired when well, we began our diets. <laughs> How many times do I have to say plant-based whole food diet? <laughs> Uh, that and uh, regular activity, it's really important uh, to have those two work together. The other thing that's really kind of interesting, I just kind of ran across this um, uh, accidentally, is that I had the 23andMe uh, genetic testing done. And one of the questions or one of the, one of the results that they give you is that they will tell you how your weight compares to other uh, 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 of your ancestors or in in your in your cohort. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. And so, uh, so if you have kind of a predestined weight range because of your genetics, it's really hard to fight with that. And mm -hmm. so, and so, I th I think the thing that's important if you are observing a, a healthy plant based diet and you're exercising, your your weight is going to drift to wherever it's right for you. And so that you don't have to be anxious about it. And so, you know, stop looking at the body mass index tables and so forth. It's it is extremely individual. You know, you can kind of tell by looking at yourself in the mirror how things are going. It's like, oh, I probably ought to up and exercise a little bit because, <laughs> you know, even on a plant-based diet, if you're not exercising, you can pick up weight. Again, nutrients are processed differently from one person to the other. So instead of saying, well, I need to to weigh 110 pounds, even though it's not realistic for you, you kind of have that, that wish out there. It's like, gee, if I do enough, if I eat right, if I exercise enough, I can get down to 110 pounds when that is not realistic for your sure. body, your frame size. Sure. So we need to give up all of that stuff, you know, eat healthfully, exercise regularly, let our, uh, let our bodies find its appropriate weight. One of the things you said uh, brings up something I hear a lot, which is, there's the, 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 the physics behind weight loss, if I can use that term, the, the thermodynamics would say mm -hmm. that if you want to lose weight, you have to eat fewer calories than you expend. If you want to gain weight, you have to eat more than you expend. And then you have the variety of people, whether trying to sell you something or not in some cases, that trumpet from the rooftops on social media and all over that that's not true. It's a matter of the kind of foods that you eat. Um, it, is, is that right, the, the calories in, calories out in general, or is that not, not really correct? Well, um, back when I started in nutrition, I kind of went through that same thing, you know, X number of cal you know, 3,500 calories in a pound, you know, and so on and so forth. And you can go through these uh, calculations that if I wanted to lose 20 pounds in such, this X, X period of time, then I have to uh, have this many calories in and this many calories out to achieve that. You know, that's, uh, the human body doesn't work that way. You know, it doesn't, you know, the math is up in your brain, mm -hmm. but it's not how your body works. Okay. Um, one of the things that I heard Dr. Greger say uh, is that, uh, so a, a calorie is a calorie. We hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, those are from the people that uh, want to tell you that 100 calories of Pop-Tart is the same as 100 calories of Apple. Mm -hmm. um, but I've heard both Dr. Greger and Dr. T. Colin Campbell, who we mentioned earlier, say that in a whole food plant-based diet, not necessarily is a calorie a calorie because your, your body, uh, with, with, there's a lot of fiber attached mm -hmm. that your body doesn't always see. So 100 cal I think uh, Greger used the example of 100 calories of nuts, you might really see 85 calories of it because of the, the fiber that's bound up. Is that, mm. is that right in yeah. your experience? Yeah, I would say that that's correct too, yeah. Because I, I think that that's, that's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. um, when I first met Cooper here, uh, he and I were having this conversation and uh, we, one of the things that I think was interesting, and I, shouldn't, I should let you talk for yourself at some point if you want, um, but it was that the idea that you could eat more food uh, and I remember I, I made a thing of, of oatmeal in front of Cooper and I put a whole frozen bag of mango in it. And I think I blew your mind a little bit. It was like, you're gonna eat that whole thing? And it's like, yeah. And, and we, we looked at the, the, the calorie count on the back and mm -hmm. I, I think it floored you a little bit how this bowl of food was just overflowing and the whole, the whole thing was not that, that calorically dense, I guess. Mm -hmm. is, is that, am I making that up? To me, I think the biggest sell about the whole food plant-based diet is you, you know, as long as you pick the right foods, you get mm -hmm. to eat more, mm -hmm. if anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, today I went to Wendy's and I got a four for four because it's four dollars and it was, you know, it's this, it's the worst type of food you can get. It's French fries and chicken nuggets, which are who knows yeah. what, and uh, you know, a bacon cheeseburger. So I. So, sorry to confess this to you, Karen. <laughs> I need to make some changes after listening to you. But, you know. So, so did you say, did you, did you later say, gee, I really am happy that I ate that meal, or it's like, I shouldn't have done that? <laughs> um, well, it was $4, so that's a lot of value there. Yeah. Um, 
No, but well, I mean, really, is it four dollars for all of that? I mean, it's cheap food, but is it four dollars worth of beneficial food? No. Sh sure, sure, but this this leads me down a path that that I, I wasn't planning on going down either. But I think is interesting is that when I was in graduate school. Uh, in New Jersey, I was dating a girl who was getting her PhD in public health at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And I had never really thought about the, the economic sort of uh, uh, issues that, that are surrounding food and what's subsidized. Uh, Baltimore is known for having these open air markets that are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And think of them as farmers markets plus a bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so Summer and I went to this place and a dozen donuts was a dollar and a tomato was three. Yeah. And she said to me, imagine if you are a, a poor single mother with four or five kids, mm -hmm. you can feed your family. They may not be thriving, but you can feed your family on the donuts, whereas to try to get enough tomatoes, and you're not just going to eat tomatoes, I mean, you're going to want to have a bunch of other stuff. That, that I think, is where mm -hmm. some people at least would say, you know, th there's economic disparity. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we live in a state where corn mm -hmm. subsidies are big. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, uh, a lot of things, meat subsidies are big. We see a lot of sort of political mm -hmm. shenanigans in there. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. There should be no subsidies at all for those kinds of foods. We shouldn't be, if, if we subsidize anything, it should be healthy food, like fruits and vegetables, to make them affordable for people who um, you know, otherwise don't have access to them. Carol Throckmorton is a food libertarian. Uh, <laughs> let the free market play it out. One of our Facebook <clears throat> questions that I, wanted, that I think plays into this is, the person asked, what do you think about food advertising? Uh, are there any blatant misrepresentations that, that really, really bother you? Oh, every time I see a commercial that uh, advertises bacon in any way, shape, or form, just I, I can hardly, I almost have to turn off the TV or whatever the media happens to be, you know, to pr promote those kinds of foods that are so unhealthy. Um, and, and I think that there's a responsibility in the food industry. I don't care what business it is. They have a responsibility for uh, promoting healthy types of foods. They should provide healthy types of foods. They should promote those. Uh, but not these other kinds of things that are not healthy. You know, if we end up spending our health care dollars because people who have these, who eat these kinds of foods, end up with health problems, and we're all ending up paying for them. I, I go to the gym four or five times a week, and I always try to run 15, 20 minutes on the treadmill at least. I always like to put ESPN on to watch the sports, mm -hmm. and I see more Domino's, Burger mm -hmm. King, Pizza Hut than mm -hmm. anything else as I'm running mm -hmm. on the treadmill. Yeah. I'm like, well, well, and, and you, it sells, and, right? And, yeah. and when you when you see those advertisements, that doesn't mean that you have to go out and get that food. I mean, that's the, you should run the other direction. So just because those things are advertised, you know, put up put up the barrier and say, I I don't care if they're advertised or not. I I don't care if they're delicious. I am not going to eat that food. I am not going to put that food that processed food like product in my body. The same person on Facebook who asked about the advertising asked this: Do you think America is too loose? with what is allowed to be sold to the public? Well, then you get back into the whole free market thing. It's a personal choice kind of thing. Um, I, I think that there's an ethics that needs to come to, into play as far as food is concerned. <coughs> um, and it's, it's unfortunate. This is one of the disadvantages of the, of the free market is that anybody, anybody can you know, promote. They can make any kind of food they want to. They can promote it. It doesn't matter how health, unhealthy it is. Uh, I, it seems to me there should be an ethics that comes into play with all of this, and we're not seeing that. Uh, one of the things I can tell you that my wife talks about, she has a good friend that lives in Iceland. And you mm. cannot, mm. this is according to, to my wife, so mm. I don't, I've never been to Iceland, I don't know if this is true. But I know that when she talks about her friends there, you cannot sell anything that has red dye number 40 in it. Mm -hmm. So M&Ms in Iceland, mm -hmm. there are no red ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I, I think that the person that asked that on Facebook is one of my wife's friends from Fairfield, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where they're, they're more conscious uh, of anywhere that I've ever seen in, in Iowa, at least, about mm -hmm. things like additives and, and so mm -hmm. forth. You know, what is, we're, we're not going to figure this out on today's podcast, but what is the responsibility? Because, uh, you know, this is sort of right, this is the free market place, mm -hmm. right? This, this republic, this democracy, it's, you know, but you said yourself, I think food companies have uh, responsibilities. So mm -hmm. do we want a country where it's illegal to sell processed meats that are class one carcinogens like smoking? Or do we want to have the freedom of, uh, of choice to say, 
I know that's bad for me. I want to eat it anyway. What What do you say? Well, the things that are that we know uh, promote disease states, like the smoke uh, meat products, uh, tax them. <laughs> we can say, okay, this is uh, this is likely to put you in the in in the cancer ward. <laughs> We're going to put a tax on this so that we can pay for your health care expenses because of the foods that you're eating. I, I have no problem with doing that. Tax, okay. At least you know taxing the things that are unhealthy. That'd be a way to get around the the free market thing. Because that's a conversation that leads into where we are in today's society. We've got, uh, I think we're down to 15 Democratic candidates. Uh, Ten of them have qualified for the next debate. All of them are talking about health care in some form. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last election, you know, Trump said, we're going to replace the ACA with something mm -hmm. terrific. And uh, not much has happened in terms of the health care mm -hmm. front, but, you know, you've got at least three of the candidates on the Democratic side, mm -hmm. talking about Medicare for all, uh, you worked in uh, private health systems and university health systems. What's your take on sort of health care in America? What direction would President Throckmorton go <laughs> if you had that that mantle? Like, what what should people be looking for when they hear people talk about health care? What's your take on all this? Well, there needs to be a really strong education component so people have an understanding of how their bodies work and how the, how their food choices affect their bodies. There should be a, a huge move on prevention. And that's where part of the education piece comes in. Um, so many of the diseases, well, most of the diseases that people are dealing with and that is part of our healthcare uh, grand expense, so to speak, uh, those are preventable. So people need to have the, the information and the benefits and so forth, learn about the benefits of eating a, a healthy type of a diet, for example, so that they uh, decrease the risk for these kinds of diseases. And that's where the plant-based whole foods diet comes in because we know that that prevents most diseases. Sure. So, One of, so that's, a, yeah. that's a huge piece. And I, I, for, for the life of me, I don't understand why that hasn't been a factor in all of these other discussions about health care. The prevention should come first. Well, and, and you brought up that uh, you, know, you were seeing Ornish's work in the early 90s. I certainly did never hear of any of it until I was doing my own research a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. It's not well known. And then as we think about potentially moving to a socialized healthcare mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. It really shifts the conversation, I think, into a public mentality because it's no longer freedom of choice because now I have to pay for it too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, well, it's, it's my right to smoke, it's personal freedom, mm -hmm. but if I have to pay for it too, now, now it's not as much. Now your choice affects me much, much more. And so uh, I think with diet, there, there, there'd almost have to be a conversation about that. But what's mm -hmm. going to happen is there's going to be these varieties of voices that we're talking mm -hmm. about today. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the the, it's the, the, the Sean Bakers and you know the, the, the carnivore, all meat, no vegetable, no fruit, just meat. You're going to get the Chris Cressers, the paleo. I used to be a vegan, but now I'm not because it was so bad for me. You're going to get, uh, you know, and then I'm sure there will be in the conversation somebody like Dr. Garth Davis, somebody like uh, Dr. Michael Greger, you know, but it, it, there, there has to be a piece in there, it seems to me, if we're going to move towards a more collective, socialized system, yes? So what is your, <laughs> after all of that, what is the question? What is the... Well, I mean, I, I guess, I, guess I, I was commenting more on a little bit about, about what you said. So um, I, I feel like people are hungry for this knowledge. One of the reasons I was really glad you agreed to come on the show, especially early on when we don't have a big following yet, is that I think people are really hungry for this knowledge. Joe Rogan's podcasts get over a million views for every single one, and that's just on YouTube. The downloads he gets are in the millions and millions. Uh, it seems like people really wanna know, but there's there's such a variety of, of noise out there from the Sean Bakers who were going, I can deadlift 575 pounds and all I eat is meat. One of my favorite documentarians, Chris Bell, he's a carnivore diet guy and he's a power lifter and he keeps mm -hmm. having pictures on Instagram of his six pack going, mm -hmm. if I were eating carbs or anything like that, I wouldn't be as strong and look mm -hmm. as good as I do. Uh, then on, on the, the plant-based side, you've got Kendrick Ferris, the only American to make the Olympic weightlifting team. You've got Nimai Delgado, uh, mm -hmm. just a badass professional bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you've got the, 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 the Williams sisters. It, it, there's so much noise. How, here's, here's a question without me just <laughs> pontificating. 
how do we break through all the misinformation and sort of uh, uh, begin to have the conversation about not about what 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 is healthy? What is the way to go? Well, that's I, I think we're going we're always going to have the misinformation, and that's because there's there's money to be made in the misin misinformation category. Certainly, people have to be have to have a level of self responsibility, so they have to learn about these kinds of things. They have to make the effort to uh, learn about what's good for their health and to make those kinds of decisions. There's there's always going to be the noise. There's always going to be the fad diet. There's always going to be you know it's it just goes on and on and on. And I don't think that you, you can't have regulations that say, well, you can't talk like, you can't say those things. You, you know, you can't pontificate this way. You know, we can't have, we're not going to have that. So it's a self-responsibility uh, issue, I think. People have to take care of their own health. And that's what I want to see, you know, in the healthcare uh, system is um, promoting self-responsibility for people. Okay. We are coming up on the end of two hours. I cannot begin to express to you how much I've enjoyed this, how much fun this has been. There's one more Facebook question <laughs> okay. that I have to ask because it was my mother. Oh, okay. okay. And um, so what, what my mother asked on Facebook was, um, for people that are, are dieting and they hit a weight plateau, mm -hmm. are there good ways to sort of overcome that that you can think of in your experience? Well, a plateau, maybe your body's telling you that this is where I need to be. You know, I, do, I don't want to go any further. Again, you know, you've got this body wisdom that we do not fully understand. Well, we really don't understand at all. But your body has this wisdom about how things are supposed to be with your own physiology. And we need to pay attention and respect that. So if you, if you uh, hit a plateau, and if you're anywhere near what you think might be a, a normal body weight, you should just just... For, just don't pay attention to it. Just give it up. Just say, okay, I'm comfortable right here. I don't need to lose that extra 10 pounds just because this chart tells me that I should do that. Because society or, says we should yeah, all look like yeah. and, and or so some, forth. Or some author of some diet book said I need to weigh such and such. You know, just pass over that and say, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to do what I know is right for my body food wise and exercise wise. And, you know, obviously not smoking and some of the other sure. habits that people engage in sure. and alcohol and all. So, um, so pay attention to your body. Fantastic. You, you are exactly what this program was created for. An interesting person <laughs> with great data and information. Are there things that you wanted to talk about uh, or promote uh, when we, oh. we have 10 minutes left? Like, <laughs> your okay. mic's yours. If you want to know more about uh, how to follow up of uh, plant-based diet, whole food plant-based diet, you can come to VegFest, which is going to be held on November 9th at the Kirkwood Center on Oakdale Road, Oakdale Boulevard in Coralville. Uh, it's a Saturday, uh, again, November 9th, from 11 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, and we're going to have some wonderful speakers, including <laughs> yourself. So um, that would be a good way to, to get started. Um, Otherwise, uh, there are, you know, uh, well, you, you mentioned Dr. Greger. Dr. Michael Greger has a wonderful uh, website. It's called nutritionfacts.org. Uh, if you want to have, if you want to learn about nutrition in a, an authoritative manner, uh, the thing that's nice about Dr. Greger is that he and his team take research, they, they review all of the research, and they uh, condense it into uh, about five-minute little um, sketches, so to speak, and they will tell you what's going on in the research about specific topics. Uh, it's a good way to keep up on what's going on in the nutrition world and without a huge investment of time and without having to pour over research, which who wants to do that? <laughs> so so um, I'll, I'll say uh, from what we know in Europe, uh, there's a huge uh, move toward veganism in Europe. It's coming our way. A vegan world is coming because we have to do it. If it's not for our own personal health, we have to do it for the environment because animal agriculture is killing this planet. We've got to do something about it. We need to do it very fast. And especially from what we're seeing with uh, what's going on in the Amazon, too, for uh, cutting, uh, cutting down trees and uh, sowing soybeans and so forth to feed the cattle and, and raising cattle there, too. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we're having this issue with the Amazon forest. We've got to stop that. And one of the ways that you do that is with your feet, and you do that by not buying meat. So if the demand decreases, they'll stop cutting down the forest, and they'll stop um, converting that land to soybean production, and they'll stop raising cattle. Same is true in the U.S. Iowa farmers need to take note that they need to change their ways. They need to be using their land and their resources for growing food for humans, 
Most of the food, most of the feed that is grown, the soybean and corn uh, uh, crops in the state of Iowa go to feed animals. We need to be using our land to uh, grow crops for humans, not for animals. That needs to be in the forefront of every farmer because this is coming, this, this change is coming. You need to get in front of it. I'm a farm girl, I was raised on a farm. I was married to a farmer for 13 years, so I've been on both sides of the fence. It's the way we have to move. When we have you back, we'll definitely talk about the environmental and the ethical side for sure. Uh, to completely nerd out before we sign off, one of the things I think is interesting is if you look into any sort of uh, TV show about futuristic things like, uh, like Star Trek and there, there's one on uh, Netflix called Travelers or something like that. In the future, ev everybody's vegan basically because they, they sort of had to do that to stop climate change and, and all of that. Although, again, you'd get the people on the right saying, well, that's just Hollywood liberals that really kind of want mm -hmm. that. But um, I do think it's interesting that, that the lore seems to kind of go, mm -hmm. go that way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Carol, thank you so much for being here. It's so great to have you here. You know, we titled this show specifically uh, Interesting People. For people that are our guests, we would love to know any interesting people that you think should be on the show, uh, anybody listening. This is your show. This is the platform to talk to interesting people from all walks of life about anything. So anybody listening or watching, drop us a comment, drop us an email. We'd love to know about interesting people in your life. And uh, final words before we sign off? Um, a vegan world is coming. Carol Throckmorton, thank you so much. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye.